That, that's from the computer. I started the, uh, the recording. So that's Google Hangouts. So that's what I use for my lecture captures here. Lecture module five, operating systems, system software. This, of course, corresponds to the textbook chapter five. And then we're also responsible for Linux lab five. And here's where it really starts to dovetail. We really can see where our background is paying off and we can really start to apply it here. Recall back in when I presented architecture, architecture was pre presented from a generational perspective. And I made the statement that operating systems saw similar generations, but the textbook doesn't present it that way. So if we re review, the first generation was vacuum tubes. And to change the programming of the computer, the, the operators actually had to change the connections. So there was no operating system, or the operating system was the operators. The second generation transistors, we saw the emergence of batch processing systems. So with the batch processing system, the operating system would be minimal, but it would allow you to run batches of data sets. So you essentially load a program, and you could run many different data sets through the punch cards. And finally, that evolved into the programs themselves were actually loaded by punch cards. So we saw this evolution. And then we saw the emergence of or development of multitasking and virtual memory. And I'll present those here. And finally, up to today, where we're in a multi-processing, parallel processing type environment. So operating system knowledge. I have written maybe the most important knowledge. I'm going to say it is the most important knowledge you can possess. Why? It's required for security. And I'm going to repeat this several times. But why is it required for security? The operating system is the resource manager. Essentially, it's the policeman. It's the cop. And if you want to bypass security, if you can corrupt the cop, you have access to resources. And we're going to learn that there are both physical resources and logical resources. But let me give you an example of why the operating system is the resource manager and actually how computation works. Most people think that, say, you're working with, within Microsoft Word and you hit the save button to save the file. Most people think that Microsoft Word is saving that file to disk. It's not. It's sending a system call to the operating system, and the operating system in super user or protected mode writes that file to disk. This is necessarily the case. If it wasn't the case, Microsoft could just kind of write that file anywhere. They could determine, hey, you don't need that music file. You don't need that movie. I'm just going to write it right there and blow that other movie, that other file away. It's the operating system that manages all the resources. In this classroom here, you know, we have printers over there in the corner. It's the operating system that manages those physical devices. Because if I can hit print, you can hit print. If we didn't have a centralized entity, the operating system, policing this, what would happen? That printer would print one of my pages, it would print one of your pages, print one of my pages, print one of your pages, and we'd get over there, and then we'd have to, you know, separate them, collate them. Obviously, this doesn't work. So some devices, like a printer, require mutually exclusive access, which means only one thing at a time can be operating on them. So we have the notion of the operating system is the resource manager, and it operates. When the operating system is doing work, it's doing it in protected mode, also known as super user mode, kernel mode, or root mode. When we are operating, when Microsoft Word is operating, it's actually working in user or application space. So we have this protective mechanism that ensures that our system remains robust. Now, an operating system also provides abstraction, necessarily so. Recall, I presented the technology acceptance model, which was based on perceived ease of use and perceived usefulness. Perceived ease of use, bless you. If we had to, whenever I wanted to save a file, if I actually had to go in and look at the whatever empty clusters there were, and I say, okay, save the first, you know, 4048 4, 4, bytes here and put the next 
whatever bytes here and then here. And then I want to actually play that music file. To go in and play that music file, well, it's located here. Give me that chunk, give me this chunk, and actually aggregate it, put it back, back together. Nobody would ever use a computer. It'd be too complex. So abstraction is the separation of the notion, so to speak, the virtual representation from the complex details. So we refer to it by its general quality. Open that file, play that song, play that movie. I don't have to concern myself with the nuances, the complexity down at the machine architecture instruction set level. So the operating system is the resource manager and it also performs that intermediary or provides that high level abstract interface that allows us to use effectively the complexity that is the computer. Now, we're going to look at a few of these things. I actually have some, I added some pictures or images to the presentation, so I'll come back to this in just a second. We need to recognize with the operating system that it always is going to be a blend of efficiency and convenience. We saw this, we see this pervasive throughout computing. We saw the memory hierarchy, right? It would be great to have fast register or cache memory throughout the system. We can't afford it. We have to blend efficiency with cost effectiveness. With the operating system, there is no one best operating system. It's always going to be a trade-off. I look at a graphical user interface, easy to use, but is it efficient? No. Recall, all processing must take place in memory. Memory is finite. To have this nice Mac or Windows graphical user interface, it's taking up memory, leaving less memory for running other things. Obviously not as efficient as it could be. The most efficient mechanism would be that command line interface, Linux. And something I haven't said to date, but without a graphical user interface, just a command line interface like Linux, you can actually enhance security, at least to the common people, right? Anyone from this class could get up and walk to my instructor's console here. There are icons, you could navigate around and do things. What if it was just a command line interface? Prior to this course, if you didn't have any Linux knowledge and you walked up to a terminal, what are the chances that you would guess that ls is the command to give a directory listing to see what files are there? What are the chances you'd guess that mv is move, cp is C, you know, copy? None. So from a, from a command line interface perspective, it is more secure, at least to the common person. Now, of course, if they have Linux knowledge, that's a whole other level. And that's where we need to get to, because that's where the hackers reside. Okay, so I covered that the OS, the operating system, is the resource manager. We'll look at this. <clears throat> a couple things here. The operating system, as I just presented, performs abstraction. It's actually performing, another term for it is transformation. It's transforming, at least to the user, this complex machine instruction set to something usable. Along with this is the notion of multiplexing. And this takes place throughout computing over and over. What is multiplexing? It's the creation of multiple logical resources from a single physical resource. And this is necessary. Think about this. I have a hard drive, single physical resource. How many files do I have on that hard drive? Thousands, tens of thousands. And I just introduced something else there. I have physical resources and I have logical resources. I have memory, eight gigabytes of memory. How many processes do I have running? Eight, 10, 20? So that memory is being shared. I have a single physical resource that is memory, multiple logical resources. Networking. On the back of this computer, I have a single ethernet port. But I can open up a browser. I can open up several browsers. I can open up Chrome, Safari, Firefox, an email client. So I have the notion of a logical network connection. So we need to be able to distinguish between the two. 
physical resource and logical resources. The CPU. Well, I have a single CPU, but I'm run, probably running several things at any, you know, in any time period. When we look at an operating system, there are several components. And we're, we're going to look at this. The textbook doesn't really present it as from a big picture like I do here. But if I look at a computer system, what are my main components? I have a file system, or and to manage the file system, I have a file manager. I have memory, so I'm going to need a memory manager. I have a CPU that needs to be allocated to various processes, so it's actually going to be called the scheduler, not the CPU manager. And I also have devices, printers, things of this nature, so I'm going to have a device manager. So that's the big picture. When I look at an operating system, it's the resource manager and it's the intermediary that actually facilitates it or makes it accessible for the general user to use. And then when I look at its core components, I have the file system, file manager, memory manager, CPU scheduler, and then also a device manager. And once you get that down, then we just kind of look at each of these elements in further detail. And that's what we're going to do right now. So chapter five from the, from the text. I added this slide. This is not in the text because I wanted to give a big picture. We have the comprehensive system. And again, in computer science, as, as we learn any discipline, typically we learn to distinguish, categorize. So I have hardware and I have software. And when I look at software, I have two major categories, application software, which we cover next week. I'm not going to cover in much detail because it's something we all use, and system software. And within system software, the most conspicuous, most important piece is that operating system, and then hence what we're covering today. So I covered all these. Operating system is the resource manager, logical and physical resources, and I, I did add this too. It's important to understand and look at our software stack. So we know we have the computer hardware, which of course has a, its machine instruction set, its architecture. The operating system sits on top of this along, and it's the operating system and device drivers. And note that I have listed there kernel, super user root mode, or protected mode. And I'll give another example, again, using Microsoft Word. With Microsoft Word, I'm working on a paper. When I come over here to this keyboard and I type the letter L, Microsoft Word is not grabbing that L. That L is actually creating an interrupt, which I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, which goes to the operating system. And the operating system delivers that L to Microsoft Word so it can record it in its open buffer. And then again, Microsoft Word does not update my screen to show that L. Microsoft Word sends a system call back to the operating system, and the operating system updates my display. Again, the operating system is that resource manager. And the first thing we think about with everything is security. And if, you, if you're going to bypass security, what are you going after? The operating system. Now, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. Back in the days, you know, early days of, well, well it's Napster. You know, so the music industry was struggling with this. People were ripping CDs and just freely distributing music. If you're going to stop someone from ripping a CD, copying a file, what do you have to change? What code? Where? On their, on their system. With respect to what we're presenting. If you're going to change something to prevent someone from copying a CD, is a CD a resource? Everyone should nod, yes. CD is a resource. So if I'm going to stop someone from copying a CD, what do I have to change? What's the resource manager? Someone give me data rights manager. The operating system. The operating system is the resource manager. If I want to stop someone from copying a CD, what do I have to modify? The operating system. So Sony was, was tired of people stealing its music. So they contracted someone to create a rootkit. 
and they put it on all of their music CDs. So when you put a Sony music CD into your computer, the root kit, by the way, what's root in Linux? It's, it's the super user. It's also the, the root of the directory, but super user mode. So a root kit has super user privileges. So it can modify anything it wants, including the operating system. So Sony put this root kit on its music CDs. People would put it in their computer. You could no longer copy a Sony music CD. You couldn't rip it. Because you, and what do you have to do? Modify the operating system. The problem is Sony contracted a third party to do it, and they didn't do their job well. And they actually left a vulnerability, left an open port, essentially, or an open vulnerability, to where someone could compromise their system and gain root privileges. Again, if you have root privileges, what can you do? Anything you want. Okay. So this failed. Now, one operating system did successfully navigate this and was able to distribute media. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Try not to give away too many details. What operating system was kind of first? Mac OS X. Apple. Apple had this reputation. Why? Why it is a lockdown system, right? Apple was able to go to the music industry and, re and film industry and say, hey, listen, I have this operating system. It's not proprietary. There are no holes. I control everything. We can create a compression and encoding scheme that no one will be able to break, and all music distribution will come through th through this, you know, policeman-oriented thing that we will title iTunes. What about like a big thing like five or six years ago, where all the music bought on iTunes from 2001 until like 2010, you had to re-download it in a higher bit rate, and they took off the data rights management. Um, I, I don't know about that. But so there's. I ever had to re-download like a ton of stuff did you? that I purchased. Yeah. yeah, and it was a higher quality as well. Well, it's interesting now. If you look at iTunes, some you know you're getting all this music for free, but you can't turn it into a ringtone. Again, digital rights management. So anyway, Apple was able to leverage their reputation and the fact that they had complete control over their operating system, and kind of created a new process. Everything goes through iTunes. So nothing is getting out. So they were actually able to make this very successful, as, we, as we've seen. If I ask from now on, what is the resource manager? Everybody knows the answer. Device drivers. So the device driver sits between the device and the operating system. And before I get to this, I mentioned this one other time. And you actually won't be required to recite this until we get to multimedia. But in computing, there are three types of interfaces. Can anyone tell me what the three types of interfaces are? Three major classifications. I'll give you the first one, just because it'll show you where we're going. Physical. Okay, I have USB ports. I have Ethernet ports on the back of this computer. Physical interface. Device driver to operating system. Software interface. If you're taking programming and logic, you're actually working with this right now. If you import a Java library and use it, right, you're corresponding to that API, that signature, you're actually doing that. The third would be human computer interface, the display, the keyboard, whatever it is, voice recognition. So physical interface, software interface, human computer interface. The device driver is a software interface. And why do we need device drivers? Well, one, Windows, Microsoft, the platform is heterogeneous. There are just many devices out there. But this also makes the operating system future-proof. Why? Windows 10 is out. Does Microsoft have any idea what devices are coming down the pike in 2018, 2020? Not a clue. So how can they write code for something they're not even aware? It's not even on their radar. Device drivers. Device drivers provide this future-proof adaptability. So in 2018, 2020, someone comes out with a new whatever device. They write the device driver. The device driver interfaces with the operating system through a set API, Application Programmer's Interface. 
And that's all the device manufacturer has to worry about. For the operating system to call this, here are the possible calls, the commands it can issue. I accept them, and then I control my device on the other end. So the device driver is this critical intermediary between the operating system and the devices themselves. By the way, the program to the operating system is also a software interface. Programs interact with the operating system through system calls. So again, my last example, I have Microsoft Word open. I type the letter L. Actually, an interrupt is driven. I'll get to that in a minute. And the information goes to Word. And then Word, to get it presented to the screen, sends a system call to the operating system saying, please refresh my screen with these new contents to sh actually show the L. So we know about the operating system, blend of convenience and efficiency. We know that today's modern operating systems typically have a graphical user interface. We know about booting. We know about configuring devices. We've covered all this. Manages and monitors resources. And we know we have the file manager, the memory manager, the scheduler, and the device manager. So file management. File management is probably the most conspicuous of all the managers within an operating system. When I execute a program, I'm not aware of where it is in, in memory. When I double click on a program and launch it, I, I don't care where in memory it's going. The operating system handles that. And again, there's multiplexing taking place. With the scheduler, I'm not really aware of when the CPU is given to, you know, to, to each process in a time slice fashion. I'm not aware of this. Whereas file manager, I have my term papers. I have my music files. I have my movies. I have all of these things. I'm very aware of file management. And I said before, this was something that kind of struck me with Apple's iOS devices because there's no visible file management. And as a computer scientist, this kind of offended me. But again, after I kind of saw what they were doing, there's an elegance to it because everything going on to an iPhone or iPad, at one point now it's iCloud too, well, went through iTunes. Resource management. There's that policeman. Anything going on to your device was managed, inspected by, and approved by Apple. There's an elegance there. Now, I have something here that I just added. It's just kind of my advice. Don't use my documents in Microsoft. Well, where's the default? Microsoft kind of puts everything in my documents. OK. What if in every house in this country, there was a place where people stored their valuables, called my valuables, even labeled? They walk in, there's a cabinet. I walk in the front door, I turn to the right, here's a cabinet that says, my valuables. How easy would it be for thieves? First house, open the door, turn right, my valuables, great, got it, moving on to the next house. That's what Microsoft has created. Nobody is hacking one-to-one. -one. It, it takes place, but I'm not trying to get into your system and then taking something out and trying to get into their system. I'm writing scripts, I'm writing programs. Do hackers know about this in my documents? Yes. If I can get into your system, it is simple. Navigate to my documents. I can code this in a, in a flash. Grab the resources. Grab them. What Microsoft has done is created a common, commonly named repository where everybody's stuff goes. How easy is that for a hacker who's going to write this program? If I break into your computer, where am I going? My documents. If I'm a thief and I'm breaking into your house, if you have a cabinet marked my valuables, yeah, it's history, right? So even we, we need to take more responsibility. We need to look out for users because they don't know what they're doing. Okay, I presented namespaces. Namespace is the set of identifiers. And I'll actually talk about this in another slide or two as I actually look at a directory structure. And I added something here. Because now we're in Linux. You've used the ls, move, cp commands, all of these things. Without the graphical user interface, we are closer to the operating system. We're not going through another graphical user interface la layer. We know that the operating system is comprised of the file manager, memory manager, things of this nature. 
Now think about what happens when you perform an LS in Linux. The file manager maintains a table, a data structure, that lists all the files and where, of course, where they're located. But when I do a listing, what's actually happening? Linux is just checking that table and saying, here, here are all the files. So when you do an LS, you're actually, again, you're in user space, and the operating system goes into pr protected mode to retrieve the information. But all it's doing is it's a one-step process. Go to that file table, that file management table, that data structure, and retrieve the information and bring it back to you. Yeah. So with this, uh, with the LS, all you can use that with PuTTY? Or no, no. All PuTTY is is a client. Oh, okay, yeah. it's client server. A CAD NX is a server here on Hudson Valley's site. PuTTY opens up a client window with a terminal. Right. That's all it is. So if I want to go to my computer, Your computer, a little more information. Here's where we have to become real specific. Okay. Are you talking Microsoft? Yeah. No, Microsoft it does not understand LS. LS is a, right, it's part of the Linux operating okay. system. Okay. Yeah. You can actually, it does, there is a command line yeah. in Microsoft, it would be dir, is the directory listing, D-I-R. So here is that file structure. And I said I would speak about namespaces. So namespaces are the set of identifiers that are visible within a specific context, directory, folder. And we know that namespaces will differ depending on the operating system. We know that Windows is case insensitive. So in letters here, I could not have a, a file by the name of James with a capital J and another file by the name of James with a lowercase j, right? It's not case, Windows is not case sensitive. It would not could not distinguish between the two. In Linux, of course, I could have a file James with a capital J and a file James with a lowercase j because the two are distinct, lowercase j versus uppercase j. Now, just as an example, I could have a file over here in school papers named John. Why? It's a different namespace. Because the computer can distinguish. Because this John would be denoted by the full path of C colon backslash documents, backslash letters, backslash John. So as I navigate down a directory structure, of course, in Windows, I separate the directories or folders with a backslash. In contrast to Linux, which is a forward slash. So again, syntax matters. Now, taking a look at this, because so I received some questions. Of course, all our user home directories are under home. And in Linux Lab 3, Sam Corey, I did ask everyone to perform a CD space dot dot from their home directory. And that puts you up here. And you did another LS. And I got a lot of questions of, I'm seeing everybody's user accounts. Yes, you were up in the home directory. So in a CAD NX, you were seeing every CIS 100 student in that list, their home directories. And you start to see why this is important knowledge. Because God forbid someone could get in there at that level in a system and go in and start wreaking havoc in people's home user space. Especially GE, Knowles Atomic Power Lab, things like that. And there's something I haven't covered yet. I'll introduce now. A big part of hacking is actually social engineering. It's understanding in advance. I'm not just going to attack your system. I'm going to do my research first. And that research may be a year long. So if I'm going to attack a system, I may only want, you know, the researchers in that corporation. Find out who their names are, things like that. So if I do get in here, I'm not wasting my time in administrative staff's home directories. I'm going straight for the researchers to get their information. Now in Linux, I also ask you to do a CD space dot dot to bring up here. And then hopefully you did some exploration, did another CD space dot dot, which takes you up to the highest level. You're at root now. And you look, look down and you saw, et cetera, bin, device. You saw, saw the main system configuration. Now you didn't have permission to do anything. 
And God forbid someone ever gets that root access. Because then I could go into bin, which is the binary executables. If I could ever replace one of the commands, ls, mv, with my own code, every time someone does an ls or mv, maybe they're sending me their stuff. Who knows? So again, without operating system knowledge, we cannot secure our system. So we have to do this. Okay, so now, kind of returning to this generational perspective, we saw generation one vacuum tubes, plug it in, you want to change it, replug it in. We saw with transistors, we learned how to do batch processing. Over time, finally, we gained the ability to perform multitasking. Multitasking is, as it says, having multiple tasks in memory executing. Now they are executed linearly, sequentially, and then we have a graphic coming up that'll, that'll show it very easily. But when I look at now sharing the CPU, the scheduler is responsible. There are a couple of different categories or I guess decisions that the OS, the operating system designer has to make. Is the scheduler preemptive or non-preemptive? Preemptive means that I can actually stop a running task. So some application is running, the operating system will step in and say, you've either executed enough or I have to do something else. I'm going to stop you and suspend you and run a different process or task. Preemptive. Non-preemptive means whatever's running has the CPU, it can just run until it's done. It could essentially starve the system. Nothing else would get done. And there are times you, you may want that in a real-time system, okay? Um, military systems, some things have priorities. So maybe you just give them a higher priority. But again, I have preemptive versus non-preemptive. <clears throat> Polling versus interrupt-driven. The best way I can present this is through an example. Our cell phones. Our cell phones say with text messages, we often use interrupt driven, an interrupt driven process. What do I mean? I may have it set to vibrate when I get a message. I may have it set to alert, you know, send an alarm, a tone or whatever. Because what the, me the message will come in and the phone will alert me that something has happened. Interrupt, it interrupted me. What if I don't have this? What do I do? And I'm expecting a te text message. I pull my phone out from my pocket. Did I get a message? No. Whatever. Did I get a message? No. Over and over, I'm polling. In fact, this is what we quite often do at a red light, right? I'm, I drive up to the red light. Is it green? No. Go back to my text. Right? No. Only kidding. Uh, so we poll. Interrupt driven is much more efficient, right? With me getting my text message, I'm not wasting compute cycles, my own, my brain cycles, continually looking at my phone. Did I get a message? Did I get a message? That's something else written up there, and we're not we're not quite ready for it. But note that whenever I switch tasks or switch processes, it's pure overhead. Think about our when we looked at the fetch execute cycle, right? There was information in memory, there was information in the registers, information in cache. We didn't show that. But if I'm going to switch processes, all that needs to be saved as a process state then I need to reload another process state. So the CPU is doing management, but it's not actually doing effective computation. And we're, we're kind of moving along the generations of computers here. A next, another advance was multi-threading. Threads are known as lightweight processes because they share address space. Because they share address space, they can do things a little quicker, especially in context switch, because you don't have to save that entire state. They're, they're sharing things. I'll give it from an example from the distinction between a process and a thread. Process-based. Say I have Microsoft Word open, and it has a document, and Microsoft Excel. They each have their separate documents open. That is not a shared address space. Microsoft Excel does not see Microsoft Word's document. Microsoft Word does not see Microsoft Excel document. In contrast, if they were threaded, they would share that document. So I would have a shared address space. 
So that's essentially the difference between multi-threading and multi and multi-processing. When we look at multi-processing, we can distinguish between multi-processing and parallel processing. And the best way to do this is through a picture. So I'm gonna jump right to the picture. Now, before I get to multi-processing or parallel processing, let's first look at essentially what is multitasking. The difference between multitasking and multiprocessing, just look at the word multiprocess. Multiprocessing requires minimally two CPUs or more, or multiple CPUs on a single core. If I have a single CPU, I cannot do multiprocessing or parallel processing. So this top one, multitasking. What we have is a single CPU, and the scheduler is allocating the CPU in kind of sequence, round robin fashion, based on time slices, probably, to a word processor. Then it stops the word processor, begins the web page loading. Stops that, checks email. Okay, one after another, sequential. The CPU is being allocated to processes in a round robin schedule. There may be certain priorities. In fact, we'll look at that in Linux. We'll actually run processes with different priorities. We'll set their priorities. In multiprocessing and parallel processing, here I'm showing at least, well, here I'm showing two CPUs. In multiprocessing, an application or process will not be spread across multiple CPUs. It will be dedicated to one. But because I have multiple CPUs, the CPUs can be working on the same time at the same time on different things. So here we see one CPU is working on word processing, spreadsheet, and then again the word processor. The second CPU is working on web page, checking email, and web page. And by the way, this kind of makes sense. These are both networked processes. These are not. So resource allocation there. In parallel processing, I will have a process distributed across multiple CPUs. So essentially the workload is divvied up. And you see this in really high scale computing, weather forecasting, things of this nature. And you'll see, you know, Palo Alto, 16 CPUs, 30 CPUs, and the application space will actually be divided um, across and separated so that they, they can work in parallel. How am I doing on time? I'm doing okay, actually. Memory management. I mentioned that moving to or evolving, we needed another mechanism really to accommodate multitasking, what other things, through virtual memory. Let me pose the question. Well, a typical you know, system here, I have what, eight gigabytes of RAM? Actually, on this system, I may only have four. Let me ask, has anybody installed Windows lately? Anybody know what its size is? How, Windows 10. How much space did it re require on your hard drive? Do you remember? Massive. Yeah, 20 gigabytes, something like that. How am I going to run a program that requires 20 gigabytes on the disk in 8 gigabytes of memory? How is that going to happen? The only way to do it is through virtual memory, which allows the creation of a larger address space. So what virtual memory does is it uses a portion of the hard drive as kind of this memory data store. So again, I'll just assume that I can use that full eight gigabytes of RAM for Microsoft Windows, which takes 20 gigabytes on disk. Well, eight's gonna come in, I'm gonna have 12 extra gigabytes that I need to have active, not sitting on disk, but kind of active that the computer thinks of active in virtual memory sitting on the disk. Again, I, I presented this back in the fetch execute cycle. A program is static, sits on a disk or in storage somewhere. When it's executed, it becomes a process, becomes dynamic. It has resources allocated to it. And it, we now know these resources are allocated by the operating system. So the operating system allocates memory, code segment, data segment, stack segment, it allocates the CPU over time, and it manages, of course, the virtual memory that allows this big program to be run in a smaller amount of RAM. And this is absolutely critical when we look at multitasking, because Windows is running 20 gigs and 8 gig, gigabytes, but I also have Microsoft Word open and Microsoft Excel. 
all of these things obviously are not fitting in my finite RAM. So here's that mechanism that I have. Now, of course, what I have to do is some translation because we know on my storage, things are stored in clusters, right? So essentially what I'm going to have is pages in memory. I'm going to page in, swap in pages or segments to simulate memory and give the illusion that I have a larger amount of RAM available to run these programs or processes. Offering and spooling. Well, you're actually installing a new operating system. You cannot run two base level operating systems. Right. We go back to that that picture I had, which had hardware, yeah. operating system. Right. There can only be one there. Now we have dual boot systems, things like that, but again, only one operating system is running at a time. We have virtual virtualization, which we're going to do in this class, but that's different too. And I'll I'll show you that when we get there. Mm -hmm. As a dual system? Yeah, cool. What operating systems? Um, it's Windows. So it's three different variants of Windows or four? No, it's, uh, it's a dual. Well, I think I put it in the HSM. And it has that, um, so, well, it's probably four CPUs. Yeah. Okay, it's four core. That, but that's different. That's architecture in contrast to operating systems, which are the system software. Buffering and spooling. This was actually easy for me to remember because we used to have print spoolers. Um, and they're still there. It's again, that terminology has just kind of been washed. It's down several layers within our operating systems now because our operating systems are so accessible. The difference between a buffer and a spooler is the spooler placed in a buffer to re retrieved by the appropriate device. So I have a print spooler. We're all printing. We print, we send the job to the print spooler and the print spooler is going to print them out. Buffers, recall, are disk buffering. Buffer is a place in RAM that the disk would read ahead, or if it's reading over it as just as a course of it, as the disk spins, it stores this inf information in the buffer because it's quite likely, due to locality of reference, that we're going to need it again. When I look at buffering, I can distinguish between direct memory access and programmed I.O. So DMA versus PIO. DMA has no CPU involvement. So this, of course, is going to be optimal. If I don't have to take any time slices away from the CPU, the CPU can keep doing what it's doing. And when, the when it needs the information, it's sitting there in the buffer. Programmed I.O., the CPU actually directs the filling of that buffer. So of course, the CPU has to be taken away from whatever it's doing load the buffer, go back to what it's doing. So again, it, it'll pr provide some performance enhancement, but not as much as direct memory access. i tell you what, this is where I got to in the last class. So I will stop right here. So again, um, see you tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to do a digital forensics demonstration too. So should open our eyes at the need to study this stuff in even, even further detail. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>